Um, so, hello everyone, uh, a very good afternoon. And uh, hopefully you'll have had your share of caffeine or tea or whatever's your preference. But uh, I'm Divya and I work at SUSA and... Um, I'm Bill Mulligan and I work at Isovalent. And we're gonna be speaking about, you know, the 10 biggest mistakes you shouldn't make in open source. And that's partially inspired by what we've experienced <laughs> and what we have committed um, as, you know, probably mistakes in our uh, open source journey. So before we go ahead, um, we would like to introduce ourselves because not a lot of, not of you all know us. So as aforementioned, my name is Divya and I work as a technical writer at SUSA. Uh, also been around in the ecosystem uh, for around two, two and a half years right now. Um, working on a bunch of open source cloud native stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, most of my, um, you know, career prior to uh, SUSE was in the proprietary side of things. And um, this journey has been really eventful, um, which is why, you know, Bill and I sort of thought of giving this presentation about how folks could actually avoid um, this, uh, the mistakes that we made. What about you, Bill? Yeah, so I'm Bill Mulligan, um, and I work in the community around Cilium and eBPF on the open source side. Fun fact about me, I actually don't know how to code <laughs> at all. Uh, my, under, my degrees are in biochemistry and social science, so if you were inspired by the keynote this morning and want to get more involved in a project but don't know how to code, don't worry, there's stuff for you in here too. But before we go ahead, we just want like a um, you know show of hands as to who's actually contributing to open source or who's actually trying to get into contributing to open source. Like, oh, that's a fair one. So uh, the very first um, thing that we'd like to sort of share uh, shed light on is you know basic etiquette, right? Uh, this is what. Uh, every kindergarten or every basic preschooling uh, activity teaches you to say your pleases and thank yous. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to you know, adult interactions, I think we kind of forget them. So uh, one of the very first mistakes that you could possibly make is to not actually be decently courteous to the fellow human beings that are across the world or you know, across the computer. So. Um, it's very easy to forget that, you know, that, that person who's sitting across the computer is not actually a person. Uh, so you should definitely, definitely uh, be courteous and show basic human decency. Yeah, uh, this is just like kindergartens. Play, play, uh, say please and thank you to the maintainers, to contributors, to every single, everybody. Right. And then when we speak about, um, you know, the fact that... Um, about, I mean, not just uh, showing basic human decency, we also need to take into consideration that um, the human being at the other end is probably going through, uh, you know, some personal struggles of his own or their own. And uh, it's important that we take that into account, be considerate and be empathetic. Especially, um, I'd like to throw, the, throw back to this incident uh, during Log4j, wherein we uh, had a huge outcry about the, uh, you know, Log4Shell um, issue. And not a lot of companies after that even took up the actual mantle of having contributors, um, you know, or sponsoring contributors to uh, that project. So as much as we'd love for, uh, you know, open source to be more considerate and oh, empathetic, towards the contributors and towards, um, you know, the projects that we, uh, projects um, that we put out, we also want for um, the reverse to happen with us, right? We want for companies, we want for organizations to be empathetic when they're interacting with us too. Um, but in the next slide, um, we realize that it's complicated because, again, uh, human interactions are complicated, humans are complicated. Um, so uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, interacting with another human being, maybe from a different part of the globe, uh, or maybe from a, you know, not a uh, different ethnicity or maybe a different race, it's, it's very, uh, you know, easy to take for granted the fact that, uh, you know, that person, um, 
is you know not doing this as part of their uh, day job and is there for you uh, as a maintainer or as a contributor uh, so targeting that person via various avenues whether it be via dms or emails or um, linkedin messages or where have you uh, it's very easy to forget that that person probably might be too busy to reply or might have a life of their own so we have to be considerate, uh, considerate when messaging or you know putting our uh, concerns across and there have been several instances not just within the kubernetes community or within the isovalent community or any of the cloud native projects that we work with but across larger um, you know the larger open source ecosystem where this has not been the case yeah another fun fact is maintainers actually do go on vacation too <laughs> sometimes <laughs> yeah and um, Talking about uh, being considerate and empathetic, how can we actually forget about, uh, you know, folks coming in and asking uh, maintainers or uh, like, you know, people in, in the contributing side of things as so to why a particular feature was not implemented. So, um, you know, it's very easy um, to actually say, hey, I actually want feature ABC to be implemented in this project. Why don't you go ahead and do it? Uh, but the thing is, it is a lot of effort. and open source projects are community driven they are not uh, you know uh, motivated by a single person's or a single company's uh, desire to move forward um, and it's essential that we take into uh, account what's best for the community as well like yes your feature is important and it's probably important to you as a person or you as an um, you know as a company or an organization but you also have to put the uh, interests of the larger community at heart while making suggestions and be nice or and show basic human decency while requesting for features because it's not easy um, a lot of us do this um, a part I mean as part of our day jobs and also outside of it so if you know you're going to pester uh, or you know you're going to be rude to uh, a maintainer or a contributor a base maybe a side effect of it will probably be that you know it'll fall on deaf ears and this is a very great example of um, how contributors uh, amongst the community in itself uh, were not you know showing the basic human courtesy of actually um, you know allowing another contributor to step up because communities um, thrive when everybody thrives Try everybody within the community thrives so if you're not allowing for other contributors to step up or if you as a maintainer are not providing an avenue for other contributors to step up uh, it's clearly a miss and it's clearly a lack of empathy from your part that you are not ready to delegate or let other people step up and do the work um, and it eventually will not bode well for anyone because uh, taking a lot, uh, taking on a lot of the work, taking on a lot of the um, you know pains um, for a project will um, sort of lead you into burnout. So nobody wins if you are not actually helpful or uh, you know allowing others to step up and uh, take on roles within the community. And I think within the ecosystem there is uh, already a guideline uh, at least in the cloud native ecosystem we have a basic guideline in place in the form of uh, code of conduct um, and that really helps set the uh, set the baseline for how community interactions should be although uh, most of the times we do find that events and um, you know um, even uh, just you know interactions within the community are uh, adhering to these there have been cases where uh, this is not followed and often oftentimes it it leads into unwanted scenarios where you know you have to take people aside and scold them like their little children and that's not something any one of us as adults cherish so uh, being considerate and empathetic is absolutely important when you are uh, getting into a community yeah and please follow code of conduct. It's not just applying to here at KubeCon, but anytime you're contributing or interacting with any CNCF projects and open source in general. Um, the next thing is uh, what I was talking about, uh, thinking that only code contributions matter. Uh, as I was saying, like I don't know how to code at all, but I still make a lot of contribute contributions to open source upstream. For example, what I'm doing here is I'm adding a blog post to the Cilium blog, you know, helping spread the word and the message and helping other people find what's going on in the Cilium community. 
Other examples that I've done uh, in terms of contributing is creating templates, so sharing like the, the knowledge that I have or you know, documenting different things. Um, Divi is an actual technical writer. Um, I just write a couple <laughs> sentences so people can find things. Yeah, and uh, for those who think, I mean, at least I've heard a lot of this um, recently that you know, uh, code can be self-documenting. Please, please do not fall prey to that fallacy. Uh, it's not the case. <laughs> um, code cannot be self-documenting for everyone. Uh, there are a lot of new contributors and um, only when you know you have good documentation can you drive adoption for your project or your product. Uh, you know if you're talking from the propriety side of things. And beyond that, there's lots of different ways to contribute besides just code. Um, a community grows through lots of different things. One example is bringing people all together at events like KubeCon, or in more local, uh, more or more regional events like the Kubernetes Community Day program bringing uh, adopters of cloud native technologies together on the local level. You can become an organizer, a program committee member, someone who is just helping like spreading the message and tweeting about that. And that's all contributions that you can do that don't require you to know how to code. For instance, uh, I gave a talk actually earlier today about the Kubernetes Community Day program. If you're interested in learning about that, I highly encourage you to check out the recording um, afterwards. And if you have any questions, also f feel free to reach out to me about getting involved in the KCD program. Uh, the next thing that you shouldn't do uh, in open source is trying to start too big. Uh, you don't want to come in with a 16,000 line PR uh, to a project. Maintainers aren't going to be happy and it probably won't get accepted. Also, it's not a great place to start because you might not know everything about the project. Um, and actually, it's a lot easier to smart with smaller contributions. These are actually my first two contributions to open source and actually Kubernetes too. Uh, if you can't quite see what it is, the one on the upper left is fixing a broken link. And the second one is adding in a documentation entry in the Kubernetes glossary. So both very small changes, but helpful for people looking for information later. Um, yeah, and I think your first code contribution was similar. Yeah, so I uh, started out um, with contributions to docs. So basically, it was a small JavaScript um, date change. Um, I mean, it was to add the dates to the JavaScript uh, code that was there within the docs. But it was a relatively small change compared to the things that normally you would expect of um, you know a contributor to do. But uh, we're here to say that please uh, you know don't think of any contributions as big or small, um, and try as far as possible to reduce the manual overhead that you know a project is facing because uh, those are important areas too. Um, given that you know a lot of people uh, try to work on trivial edits, but um, or trivial parts to a project, but. Automating it will man will help like a lot of manual efforts for the uh, you know for the manual efforts to be saved rather uh, when you know uh, the maintainers actually have to work on uh, reviewing and everything else. So don't try to start too big. Uh, even minute contributions help and focus on trying to reduce the manual overhead overall rather than you know targeting um, you know. For small edits or small parts of the documentation because uh, as you grow in the community impact uh, impact matters a lot the kind of work that you do matters a lot and uh, making trivial uh, trivial edits uh, will take you so far but uh, you should also go beyond that and try to help the project in general with uh, reducing the manual overhead that they have Yeah, <laughs> the next thing is, as you're starting to contribute, um, there are a lot of resources uh, in a lot of projects, and you should do your research. Um, I know a lot of maintainers get slightly annoyed um, by the questions that are asked repetitively over and over. If you saw the keynotes this morning, we have about 1,000 maintainers supporting 7 million people. Unfortunately, that doesn't scale out. Uh, this is why we try to document a lot of things, and you should try to see what is out there, kind of look around. Um, the things that I would recommend doing if you're approaching a new project and trying to figure out how it works and how you can contribute to it, the first one is 
read the README. Um, it's called README for a reason, and it's a really good place to start. Uh, the second one is if you're in a project Slack, uh, a lot of them have uh, pinned items. Those are important things, usually uh, ways to contribute, style guides, uh, important resources, who you should contact. Uh, look at the resources that people have pointed out for you to use. Uh, attend a meeting. Uh, this is a great way to get that one-on-one -on -one connection. So if you think you want to move forward with something and you do want to get in contact with them, uh, a lot of projects do have meetings. And the last one is most projects and all the ones under the CNCF should have a contributing file. If you want to contribute, uh, read that. It has the ways that you should do it, probably how to set up your environment if you're contributing code or how they want to style things if you're contributing documentation or other ways that you can contribute to the project too. Um, and it's usually a great resource to start with. Add one, one last item to whatever Bill has said. So plus one to whatever he said, but over and above that, if you find things missing in the contributing or in the readme files, that's a good way, first uh, you know, way to contribute to the project too. Go ahead, make that uh, suggestion to the person who is uh, probably leading the say, leading the areas of efforts for that particular, you know, uh, project, and talk to them about including that thing in their particular README or in their contributing, so that it becomes easier for the next generation of contributors to start contributing to that project. Yeah, for instance, so when I joined Isovalent, I wanted to add some things to the website, but I realized. The how to contribute to the website wasn't documented anywhere in the contributing uh, markdown. And so I added that section to the contributing doc so that other people, when they want to contribute to the website in the future, have the resources to be able to do that. And um, like I said, um, when you go about this journey, you are bound to require help, um, all of us do. It's not like a lonely journey where you have to, you know, go all alone and reach the top or whatever. Because like I said, commun a community thrives when all the members thrive. Um, so uh, people are available to mentor. Uh, it's just about you seeking them out. Uh, one of the major, I think, uh, mistakes that people assume when they are experienced is that hey, I already have a job. I already know X, Y, Z about some part of uh, the tech uh, industry. I don't need anybody coming in and telling me about other stuff. I can probably figure it out if I read the documentation alone. But that's, that's a major flaw because uh, what tends to happen is um, the human interaction or the value that a human interaction can bring um, is uh, grossly undernoticed by most of us. Uh, pri primarily because um, in... Uh, more academic or corporate setup, uh, mentorship is not something that's actively encouraged. Um, we don't have programs for that. So uh, in open source, it's different. We have actual programs and we have informal ways of, uh, you know, um, delivering mentorship um, to people who are in need. So seek out mentors, uh, seek out people who you want to actually, um, you know, uh, who you think have a good grip of the ecosystem, ask them for help. Um, obviously, ask them in a nice way um, because, you know, they're humans too. But it's, it's in instrumental in, you know, uh, getting your journey off the ground because w what, what a human interaction can do to your career um, is something uh, that's, that no, you know, reading docs can. So that's, that's one thing. And we have several, uh, you know, uh, internship programs. It's not just uh, Google Summer of Code, Google Season of Dogs. These are just four that we remembered. Um, but there are several of them. And uh, fun fact, I think a lot of them also accept experienced uh, members within the uh, industry. It's not just for college students. So, uh, you know, take, take the opportunity of seeking out mentorship and actually, uh, you know, taking help from somebody else in the ecosystem so that you can navigate it better. Yeah, and the cool thing about all the programs listed on this slide is they're actually all paid too. So you can get paid to learn and contribute to open source. For instance, right now in the Cilium project, we have a mentee working on improving the security of the release project for all of our projects, which is pretty cool. 
Um, but beyond just like paid ones or those programs, there's other programs across the ecosystem too. Yes, so this is like the Kubernetes release shadow uh, shout out that I have to give because uh, this was one of the things that I was part of. Um, and uh, it's, an, it's a fantastic program to get involved in for uh, new contributors and experience to like because you get to have a grip of the ecosystem, the Kubernetes uh, project ecosystem, of course, not the entire CNCF one. But you understand the ecosystem better because there's someone to handhold you and show you the ropes rather than you trying to, you know, climb it all alone. So this was uh, one of uh, the instrumental programs where I met a lot of friends and I made a lot of them there in the audience. So um, shout out to them and uh, shout out to all of them who gave me a chance because I wouldn't be here if, they, if it was not for them. Uh, the next one is not attending meetups or events. When we were talking about it's also important to meet people in person, uh, these are a great way to do that. Create that one-on-one -on -one connection, find a mentor or someone who can help you out with the next project. Being here at KubeCon is one of those ways, but you don't have to travel halfway across the world to meet other people in the cloud native ecosystem. As I said before, there's probably a KCD in your area that you could attend, uh, or you could go to one of the CNCF meetups in your cities or a, a city close to you. For instance, I think this is a really great example. Um, so he attended KCD Bangalore and attended the Kubernetes Contributor Summit there. Uh, well, there he got inspired to start contributing to the project um, and became a mainer, maintainer of one small part of the Kubernetes project. He was then able to give a lightning talk at KubeCon in Valencia in May. So you really see this from attending event all the way up to becoming a maintainer and uh, giving a talk at KubeCon. It's really this whole spectrum all kicked off by you know, attending and being expired at the local level. So it's a great way to meet people and to start your journey. I actually also have a similar story. This picture is from me in Barcelona in 2019. Uh, what I didn't know, the person just to the left of me uh, was going to be my future boss. Um, so I met Liz uh, first on a bike ride when I attended KubeCon. And when she tweeted, I had actually already met her a couple times on bike rides. And it made it easier for me to find my job at Isovalent. Um, yeah. So... Uh we basically wanted to give a shout out to our own talk like this like inception at this point but uh, one of the things that we uh, wanted to give a shout out to uh, is the fact that um, we wouldn't have been here had it not been uh, for others who shared their learnings with us and others who had not shared their mistakes with us and handheld us um, um, and attended these e and had we not attended all these events um, so that is one aspect of it but also it provides a nice segue to the next one where and, you know, uh, they shared their learnings with us. They shared their mistakes with us, whether it be via talk, whether it be via a blog post, whether it be via an, uh, a video. Um, all of them shared their learnings with us, and uh, we try to pay it forward by doing the same thing. Um, so I think Bill um, uh, writes a newsletter uh, every uh, fortnightly uh, basis, and I try to, you know, write a newsletter every week. Not successful. Um, <laughs> in terms of the fact that I stick to the routine, but I try. Um, and that's my way of paying it back forward. Uh, I mean, not paying it back forward, that sounds wrong, but paying it forward. So uh, that's, that's, um, that's one thing that you always need to uh, you know, do when you're in an ecosystem, because once you're at the states where you are able to, uh, you, know, um, you, know, you know something, you at least know how to contribute, it's your job to lift others up as well. And it's absolutely essential that you uh, pass on the knowledge to an, another contributor, maybe experienced, maybe, um, you know, an, um, maybe new, because everybody stands to learn something from another person. I learned a lot uh, by working with Bill on this one. So um, it's all about sharing what you know and learning from others in this case. Yeah, and sharing your learning is another great way to do non-code contributions. So these are Divya's and I's GitHub repos and the different ways that we've shared our learnings. So as she said, we each have newsletters. We've also given different talks like this one to share our learning with the community. We've written blog posts and spoken on different types of podcasts. Each one of these are great ways to help educate other people and get them involved in open source. And uh, one of the things that you that I probably am guilty of uh, earlier on in my career is to not experiment at all. 
probably that's also because of the fact that I had a job and this is not dissing my previous employers, uh, PSA. So um, it's I was also in a job where I wasn't really give. Uh, allowed to experiment is not the right word, but I didn't have the time to experiment because I was doing my nine to five, going back home, doing the daily routine. But when it comes to open source, we have the option to choose our own adventure. I think uh, Taylor was the one who actually uh, said it in today's keynote that open source is all about choosing your own adventure. So that that is one thing that that's afforded to us as contributors within open source you get to choose your own adventure you get to choose where you go next and if you don't take that opportunity it's um, you know going to be sad because every every single interaction that you have every single um, you know talk that you attend could be the next uh, thing that you get interested in and tinker on so my journey sort of looked uh, like you know First, I was an electronics engineer. I was not even part of the IT industry. And then I jumped into IT and uh, worked for like, I think, around eight years um, as a systems administrator. The only reason I came into open source was because of Kubernetes and trying to explore the Kubernetes project. And from there onwards, it has been, you know, experimenting uh, with one project after the other. And I, I'm not going to say that I know a lot, but I know a little more than what I did when I started out. And <laughs> that's a lot because I really think that, you know, it gives us so many opportunities to actually um, grow not, not only in our careers, but as people. Uh, because in the previous, like I said in the previous slide, it's a learning journey and you get to learn not only from uh, the technical side of things, but also, you know, from a holistic, uh, you know, personal growth side of things as well. Yeah, and from my side, like I said, I had absolutely no idea what IT was. I sat down at my first day at my first job and they said, open the command line and I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> uh, obviously, I've come a little bit from there, but not very far. But kind of on my journey, how I got from each job to the next was actually following all the advice they were doing. So when I was at my first um, job, I started attending local meetups and events. That eventually landed me my second job. While I was there, I started to share what I'd learned through the open source ecosystem and had non-code contributions to the ecosystem. That helped land me my job at CNCF, where I made lots of friends, attended KubeCons all around the world, shared my learnings, and started doing my research. And it's ultimately how I ended up here at Isovalent working in the Cilium and eBPF communities. My whole journey has been an experiment in what I was interested in. And last but not the least, you know, um, like I said, we are, you know, still very much interacting with humans in open source. The bots haven't taken over yet. So, um, you know, why not make friends along the way? Why not, you know, join people along for the ride? Uh, because otherwise it's just going to be a long, long journey with no, you know, with nobody to accompany you. So, um, I met a lot of, um, you know, my friends, current friends in the cloud native community. And it also definitely helps solve the problem of, you know, not having to, um, you know, not having adult friends when you're 30. So like I basically solved that problem as well. Uh, but having uh, a community around you means you get to learn, you get to make friends and um, you get to have a lot of fun uh, at events like this. Yeah, and I think the best part about open source is once you leave a company, uh, you still get to work with the same people. Uh, you don't have to leave your friends behind as you move from company to company. They keep going with you on your open source journey. So uh, make sure you make friends along the way. Yeah, I think there's like this uh, quote that commonly gets thrown around. It's um, different company, same team. So I think that's the ethos of open source because a lot of, uh, you know, the same folks uh, uh, run around in the same circles. And it's always a pleasure when one person su uh, succeeds because you get to share it as a community. Um, but that being said, I think we are at the end of a presentation. And thank you so much for having the patience to sit through it. Um, yeah. And uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for coming. Oh, also, if yeah, there are any questions. Yeah, we have time for questions, questions too. Yeah. Uh, we're happy to answer any. Yeah? yeah. It's actually not a question, but maybe slide five, I, I think you could add. 
when there is a template for opening an issue or a PR, like, fill the template. Just don't, like, <laughs> forget to say <laughs> half of whatever is required. Yeah, I think that goes along with the doing your research. A lot of projects do have templates for yeah. issues and PRs. They're not just there by mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Yeah, we have a question back there. Okay. We have two questions back there. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, as someone who created an open source project and then sort of left because it was just too overwhelming, how would you recommend dealing with people who come with a great feature, but accepting that feature just leads to more work for you in the future because they leave and don't come back and maintain the feature? Yes, yeah, so you're talking about like drive-by contributions where, yes, you can accept something, but then it's up to you to maintain it. Um, I would honestly just be clear with them up front and be like, this is a great feature. Unfortunately, we don't have the support maintenance or we don't have the support um, required to like keep maintaining this. We're happy if you have your own fork of this uh, where you do that, but we, unfortunately we can't uh, maintain it upstream unless that person wants to maintain it. Um, I think it's easier if you're just transparent from the beginning um, and like maybe defining it in your roadmap what is and isn't part of the project. Um, it's sometimes tough when people hear that their feature or what they really want isn't going to be accepted, but I think it's probably better that than burning out the maintainers. And it's easier to do that from the start of the process rather than trying to pull it out way later. Yeah, I kind of agree with that, uh, setting expectations right at the start yeah. uh, with the help of a roadmap and with the help of proper scoping, uh, because that is sort of what helps um, set the expectations and, um, you know, set the baseline for how, you know, people can interact with us. But if there are situations where that arise and, you know, where such, situation, uh, where such cases arise and, you know, people are coming and asking you for a uh, feature or demanding rather, I don't think there is... Um, um, uh, you know, anything wrong with them asking for it, but um, you need to um, communicate to them. And that's also a very good way for them to, uh, you know, invite potential new contributions. So if they want to start maintaining an upstream fork of it or whatever, they are also welcome to do it. Or if they are key to, uh, they are okay with helping out with the maintaining or, um, you know, creation of the new feature, um, or enhancement, they are welcome to do so, but they will have to expend the efforts that require uh, any further work on it. They are welcome to build a community around it, and that could possibly pave the way for newer contributors to chip in. So it, again, setting the uh, expectations right and uh, communicating it right at the start is important. So I completely agree there. Oh. We have, a, oh. Yeah. Great presentation overall, I love it. There are a lot of people that I imagine here that are trying to get into open source. So I love the tip about you don't have to be a developer or provide no or code contributions <laughs> because I am not a developer. Um, that being said, can you explain how you both are so awesome? <laughs> I'm not, easy answer. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I think, the most important thing is like it's a community and you create, build, and maintain the community that you want to be a part of. And so I think the key thing is if you want a great community, you have to be fun, you have to be helpful, you have to encourage other people to contribute. And if you continue to do that, those are the people who will be attracted to you. And if you instead create a bad environment, those are the people who will be attracted to you. So it's up to you what type of community you want to contribute to and you want to be a part of. Yeah, so going against the laws of physics with just a bit, like attracts like at this point. So you embody the values that you want to build in the community yourself. And uh, I think the rest follows. Like if you're transparent, if you're uh, truthful, if you're honest about what you're doing, I think those are the kind of people that you attract. And those are the kind, again, setting expectations right at the start, right? So, yeah. Okay. Oh, we're, we're, we're being, we're being axed. We're being sorry. thrown off the stage right yes, now. Yes. Apparently, we weren't we're that awesome. Thank you for Thank coming. You so much. We'll be here for questions if you want. Yeah.